Mantis and the Cricket. Tales from the Tours. We weren't as good a side as they were. We'd never played under conditions like that before. But I think without exception in those days, we all said if you're asked back tomorrow, would you go? And we all said yes. It was the year building began on the Auckland Harbour Bridge. New Zealand established a new base in the Antarctic and BOAC sent their new jet, the Comet, winging into Fanuapai. New Zealand cricket itself was breaking new territory. 1953, a team was sent to South Africa for the first time. And now, with Henry Cooper as manager and 15 men, they continued that process of broadening cricket's horizons by going into India and Pakistan. It was a formidable assignment. Eight tests in 13 weeks in unknown conditions. The team departed New Zealand in spring and immediately hit a heat wave. And it was a collision from which they never fully acclimatised or recovered. The fast bowlers were bedevilled by unresponsive pitches or emasculated by matting wickets. The spinners were unproductive or incapable of containing opposing batsmen. And our batsmen met vocal crowds and partisan umpiring and turning pitches and accomplished spinners. All this added up to interminable periods spent in the field. And off the field, the team were beset by an epidemic of illness which often reduced them to a less than a full complement of fit players. Now you're probably watching this in relative comfort and familiar surroundings. In 1955, the team had no such luxuries. Under the stairs in my house here, our house, I've got some coloured slides taken. I took about 300 of them. And when I came home, I used to take them all round Otago because people wanted to see what it was like in India. And I used to show these coloured slides. And I said, there are two things missing. One is a sound track on one side and the other is a smell track on the other side. <laughs> and, if you, and if you can imagine seeing something like that and imagine the smell that goes with it, which you can't because you haven't been there. I said, then, then you start to get half the picture. Bananas, 600,000 population or a million roughly, four million in the season. You know, the, the facilities just can't cope with it. So you're bound to get, uh, particularly when you look at the Ganges and see these bodies being uh, thrown into the Ganges and funeral pyres on the side of the... And they had uh, fish in the Ganges that looked like porpoise. Uh, quite big ones, kind of lolloping along. But the difficulty there, they had... Uh, at the Ganges, at Benares, rises 42 feet in a top flood. Now, that's a hell of a lot, isn't it? So that covers everything? Yeah. So the, I think the, you couldn't help picking up disease. So you, so you actually saw the funeral process? Yes, all along. Then they, they'd go down in the holy water and they'd be you know, brushing their teeth with it and pouring it over each other. So it's terrific, uh, really. Uh, but as far as hygiene is concerned, uh, you, you couldn't escape it. Then cows walk down there. The markets and kind of help themselves to vegetables, they're sacred. So. All their tucker was cooked in ghee, they call it ghee, and it doesn't matter what you're eating, it was orange in colour, and uh, it was bloody awful. We lived a lot on uh, uh, watermelons and bananas and, and oranges and goodness knows what. I didn't mind the food too much. It's uh, India with uh, the curry, if you had curry, that was, you know, they, I remember going to uh, Ramchand's place with John Reed for dinner. And we John and I said we'd love to go, but provided there are no hot curries. Oh, he said, John, we, we will only use one quarter of what we normally did. Christ, I never forget looking across at John halfway through the meal and the perspiration was running down there. He said to me, oh, well, that's a quarter strength. How the hell are they that is a full stream? So that was the other problem you had, and that kind of kept your uh, internal system uh, in a state of kind of guessing as to what's coming next, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know where it was, but it was a reception at some place that we arrived at, and it was an outdoor cup of tea with cakes and <laughs> cups of tea and all the rest, and it was uh, surrounded by buildings 
and on the buildings with the vultures all around. Just, it was as if they were just waiting for you to drop over and then down will come. But, oh. It's those cakes. In interesting. The cakes. Got, yeah. Uh, the icing, of course, that I always remember was uh, bright red instead of pink. You know, nothing appetising looking about them, as you would know. Always handed to you, not on a plate, but by, in someone's hand and being his right hand, which he probably used as, uh, instead of paper in the toilet, let's yeah. put it that way. So uh, we had a lot of things we steered clear of, you know. We had a reception in Dhaka. That was, uh, it's now Bangladesh, it was East Pakistan or West Pak East Pakistan. We had a reception there in the Botanical Gardens in the middle of the town. And the, it was really, it's about a compound, about you know, 400 yards by 400 yards by 400 yards, and served as a roundabout at the same time. So we had an afternoon tea party, and at that stage they, were, they loved giving you afternoon tea parties, the old British Raj style. So we we're all there, and all the councillors lined up. And uh, you know, we, we, they came introduced with Harry Cave, were introduced to uh, us each one, and he walked down fairly quickly introduced, and the councillors were shaking hands, their hands going in all <laughs> directions like a big rugby skull. I'll never forget that. Then in the meantime, all the cars were going round this uh, outside this little uh, garden, and uh, with ho ho horses uh, horns honking and. You know, all the all the rest of that program and crows everywhere, crows up the trees. And I remember Ian Galloway said that they were serving you tea, and the tea you had didn't have any choice. It was white tea, but there was so much sugar in it you could hardly eat it. So uh, Ian Galloway just got rid of his third lot of tea when, because every city you got empty, somebody would come and fill your cup up, and uh, he was just going to get rid of it. Uh, and pom, the crow hit him dead center <laughs> in the cup. So then he didn't know what to do, so he sneaked it and chucked it under the table there. Uh. <laughs> we had Christmas dinner in India with the Maharaj Kumara of Visianigram, Vizy for short and he's the eldest son of a Maharaja, and we have it in his palace, and he just shot his 300th tiger or something. And incidentally, presented a tiger skin to John Reed, Beth Sutcliffe, and Noel McGregor as a baby. I missed out, unfortunately. I was always one of those unlucky people. But anyway, um, Jack Alabaster was determined I didn't miss out because the dining room, banquet room, was really superb. Gold this, gold that, gold cutlery. And the whole lot was absolutely terrific, and all these uh, tiger skins all around the around the room. So uh, anyway, we had a good meal, champagne out of uh, gold goblets or gold and silver goblets, and we uh, got up to go. I had al alabaster. Jack was on my side, and I got up to go. And uh, I thought, my God, I'm a bit down on the right hand side. And I put my hand in my pocket just as I was approaching a seat with a big lance. And here I had a full set of cutlery to the alabaster and put it in my pocket and I was going to walk out past it, so I had to duck, duck back and discreetly put it back on the table. <laughs> now, they're the types of things that your friends do, you know? What the hell would your enemies do? <laughs> <laughs> One other thing that cured me, that helped me immensely, was having a beer. I only drank beer in those days. And I loved my beer. And I was drinking, drinking uh, after a game when, and I got friendly with a, an English tea planter. And we're having a few together, and I was, got round to the tummy troubles and so on. He said, oh, Matt, he said, do you drink scotch? And I said, no. Nope. And he said, all right. And he ordered me a scotch. He said, now drink this. And he said, stick to scotch and drink it straight. Nothing else. So I did that and fixed my tummy, right? Nothing else would live in there, eh? <laughs> I made sure that the boys took plenty of spirits, uh, as much spirits as they were allowed to take ashore to take, and they would be bought by those who didn't drink them. And uh, a neat Scotch or a neat gin wasn't wasn't a bad uh, wasn't a bad pick me up against uh, all the rubbish and helped kill a few of the bugs I think but no water with them you wouldn't put ice in. The only thing I remember about that was that beer was very expensive. And two stories about that: Ian Galloway had just had got engaged. He he was the New Zealand Press Association, and he uh, he just got engaged in Dunedin before he left. Virginia. Virginia, that's right. And anyway, he didn't, uh, didn't shout anybody. He came over 
uh, to Pakistan, so we congratulated them. He said, oh, well, he said, uh, didn't cost me anything. He said, I got out before I had to shout anybody. So they said, well, you can shout us. I'd be delighted, he said. What he didn't realize, beer was about $5 a bottle and God knows what. He said, it would have been cheaper if I had stayed in the Dean than done the job. Uh, we decided we'd get engaged. Um, she won't like me telling this story. Uh, we decided we would get engaged and I said, well, if you're certain, but I said, don't in the, in the excitement of drama of me going off to, to unknown territory, um, don't, um, don't just ac accept for that reason. And I said, I'll, we'll set off, I'll sign an engagement notice uh, and you can put it in the paper, uh, you know, if you feel when you want to, if you feel everything's okay. And I took off on those terms. And um, about uh, a week later, uh, at uh, Karachi, uh, a cable started to arrive saying heartiest congratulations and things. So I, that was how I presumed that Virginia had put it in the paper. Uh, and so I announced this foolishly, yes, um, on the team bus, uh, going back from the ground to the stadium at Karachi, and uh, and uh, it cost me. It was quite expensive because um, uh, liquor over there was very, very uh, rare, scarce, and very expensive. And it was an expensive night, especially as I wasn't getting paid anything on the tour. <laughs> but it was worth it all, worth it all, of course, in the long run. Well, I remember it was at Bawapur. I didn't play, and I'd, uh, I'd had stomach trouble, and I came down to the ground about uh, an hour before lunch, and uh, went into the loo, <coughs> standing there looking out into a, a courtyard at the back. They had uh, tarpaulins over the courtyard, and the, the team's lunches were being prepared there. And they had gas burners, or they had burners, and they used cow dung, of course, and they're heating fish, and they picked the fish up, uh, and put it in the pan, and they pick a bit of cow dung up to feed the fire. The flies, I got a photograph of that, and the flies there were appalling, so I decided immediately I was going back to the hotel for my lunch. <laughs> so I told the guys when they came up, I'm sorry, I can't stay, I've got to go back to the hotel. <laughs> but oh, that was bad. Well, it may add to the taste, but Bahawalpur's a very long distance from the coast to eat fish. And I'm uncertain whether I'd try any protein or nourishment that was pulled from the murky rivers of the Punjab. But what of the players in those series, and what was New Zealand's approach? I think we took them too lightly in the early stages. Uh, it was all so unfamiliar, and to see all these hundreds of uh, children and grown-ups in, in ragged shirts and, and shorts, bare feet and, 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 and grown up middle-aged people rushing up and saying, sign please, sign please, with their autograph books and children and uh, gibbering away and things like that. I think, I think we all thought it was all a bit, you know... Um, There'll be a pushover. It'll be going to be a pushover, exactly. And of course, it was a pushover, all right, but the other way. Yeah, the wicketkeeper, nice fellow, really lovely fellow, M.T. as was, and um, uh, he made, did he get 190, 200 or something? 200. 200, yeah, that's right, yeah. Lovely batsman, played all the shots, and um, and was really, he was good to look at, good to watch, but damn nuisance because he was against you, but but he, he, well, he, he, he killed us in that game. You know, it looked like, it looked like we might have been able to, um, we might have, um, we might have won that test match. Yeah. But Hanif, of course, was was against you in that. Hanif, uh, he was uh, a, a master, um, master batsman. He was a good batsman, but I think he had the umpires on his side as well. And I don't know how many times we, um, we had to knock the stumps down to get him out, I think. But that's not only us. That's the rest of the world um, uh, found the same oh, the same problem. So you'd forced him back, John. I, I forced think him that's back. That's the story. Yeah. Well, he he thought a bouncer was coming. Uh -huh. And I thought it was too, <laughs> but it, didn't. it came a bit further up. That's yeah. why he came back, I think. And hit his wicket, eh? Hit his wicket. Oh, was that Hanif Muhammad? Yes, it was. God. He was opening, and that was your first test. Okay. First test wicket. Yeah, in Pakistan. Yeah, yeah now, Hanif, all right. Um, now, I could get into trouble by uh, <laughs> saying some of the things I thought of some of these guys. Magnificent cricketer, but. Uh, that's where, as far as I'm concerned, that's where it finished. And if I like to describe some of these things that he did on the field, I could 
be sticking my neck out, so I think I'd better be quiet on some of those things. figure in the match was a man called Mushtaq Ali, who had been a prominent test player but had retired, and he was the most unorthodox batsman I've ever seen. He would dance down the wicket to people like uh, Harry Cave and McGibbon and John Reed, and he'd meet them sort of halfway <laughs> and hit them back overhead, or he would step three or four paces or two or three paces outside the leg stump <clears throat> before the bowler bowled or as he was coming into bowl, regardless of where it was going to pitch, or he'd go a couple of feet outside the off stump. Extraordinary batsman. Uh, anybody who's been on that tour will remember the innings that he played. Uh, he only got about a dozen in the first innings, but he got 70 in the second innings, and it was a marvellous exhibition. Kripal Singh was a Sikh, very nice chap, very good all-rounder, but had to come to our team for companionship. His team would have nothing to do with him off the field. So... Uh, uh, he came with us, we went to pictures, we went for a beer, we did this, and Krippel came with us. He was part of the opposition side. Is that right? Yeah. Pretty lovely. Nice chap. Yeah. Lovely fella. But I got a pair in uh, the fifth test at um, Madras. I noted that. Yes, and this fella had dinghy fever. <laughs> but they're kind of worrying about here now. So I had a, this, I remember sitting... Uh, the next day, we were playing Nagpur. I remember sitting with John Reed watching, and I said, Good Lord, John, I said, it's cold. He said, don't be funny. Somebody's told me it's 103. And that was the second uh, day that I'd had dinghy fever's uh, incubation period before it shows. But I had a headache to beat all headaches. So I was in bed for the uh, combined universities game at Nagpur that once. I was in bed for three of the days of the game. So I was lucky to get out of India too. But I got a pair in the dress. That's uh, when it was starting. That's my story anyway. <laughs> what about New the New Zealand bowlers? I mean, there was Cave and there was McGibbon and there was Hayes. But very difficult for them. It must have been uh, in those well, conditions. Well, the wickets, you know, the pitches were, the bounce was about that high. Um, and we didn't have any decent spinners. Oh, you... Alabaster and Moyer were there, weren't they? Yes, they were. Um, but they're very good, the Indian batsmen are very good players of spin bowling and you've got to be top line. Not that I'm saying that Jack Alabaster who developed into a, into a top liner in, 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 in uh, South Africa in 61. Tremendous. But Alec spun, spun the ball a lot both ways uh, but wasn't quite as accurate. Gave you a loose ball per over which is too many. Um, and the, the Indians and Pakistanis just picked them off. I roomed by pure coincidence with the two spin bowlers, the leg spin bowlers, uh, Jack Alabaster and Alec Moyer, in Hyderabad for the first test against India. And in the, neither of the bowlers, neither of those two had any success on that tour, really. The uh, Pakistanis and the Indians were very fine players of slow bowling. And uh, Alec had played, and I think Jack had played in one test in Pakistan, but hadn't bowled. And Alec had uh, played in Pakistan, but for the first test in India, Alec was dropped, and he was the he was the incumbent, and he bowled so well. I remember in 1950, he bowled so well, got six for 150 or something against England, and bowled Hutton with a wonderful leg break at Lancaster Park, and Alec was the was in there, and Jack had come into the team without having played a first class match, and I was rooming with these two and Alec was dropped and Jack was picked. And then I was sitting, I was sitting with uh, Alec when Jack came on to bowl and as usual the Indians had made a good start. They were making, you know, they were away, the batsmen, and they were right on top. And Jack came on for his first over in test cricket and, and bowled a maiden, bowled a maiden uh, to some very informed Indian batsmen. And Alec said to me, uh, he said, there goes my tour to England. Because uh, three years later, or two years later, they were setting off for the 1958 tour of England. And as it happened, it wasn't there it goes, because both Jack and Alec went on the tour. But it was quite a tense five days. Um, <laughs> what was it like in the room? Being the catalyst in the room with Jack on one side and Alec on, Alec on the other. Yes, competition for the same position can cause a good deal of angst and contemplation on a tour. 
But now, nearly 50 years distance from the experience, what are some of the players' thoughts about the tour? We came home beaten. We, we weren't as good a side as they were, to be honest. And that's why you lose, basically, isn't it? But then um, we'd never played under conditions like that before. It was, we were away 16 weeks. We played eight five-day tests. Uh, on the day we arrived, we had 16 bods upright. The next time we had bods, 16 bods upright with the hands up saying, I'm ready to play was the third test. And even by the end of that, they had substitute fieldsmen. And only the once on tour was everybody standing to be ready to be picked, you know. There's not a day goes by that you're wondering, you know, about this or that, the other thing, or one of the team has got a problem. And, um, you know, we didn't get uh, the manager on the field at any stage, but it must have gone very close. I remember uh, one of the biggest reliefs that we landed at Singapore, stayed a night at Singapore in the Raffles Hotel on the way back. And uh, to, to see uh, life as we expected to be lived with uh, restaurants and uh, people, no, no poverty at all, it was just, it was a good kind of uh, lead on to coming back to New Zealand. We survived. Um, we had some good performances. Bert Sutcliffe batted like, like a master, he is. And um, we had some good bowling performances. We had some interesting situations. Well, considering the uh, things that happened to us and all the rest, no, it was just as well. I think it made it easy, easier for us. Everybody suffered badly. When we got back home, you had poor Harry Cave and Bert, and, uh, you know, they were just shadows of themselves. But I think without exception in those days, we all said, if you're asked back tomorrow, would you go? We all said yes, you know, just for the experience. But I'd go back again. <laughs> That's the funny part. I think it's terrific. It's life. Zinn Harris was a very fine tourist who um, didn't have a successful... I was so glad Zinn did well in South Africa because he was a wonderful chap, Zinn, and um, uh, the most untidy tourist I've ever roomed with or no toured with, I think. Zinn, Zinn um, it wasn't... A, yes, he wasn't a spick and span, neat and tidy. <laughs> he wasn't terribly organised uh, on tour, but he was... He gave it everything, uh, Zinn, and he wasn't well, but he, but he battled on, didn't have much success. And that's how you judge the quality of these fellas. It's all right when they're succeeding, but when you're having a bad trot, um, then you see true quality come out of these fellas can, can um, you know, shape up and take part in everything. And I remember, I remember one person particularly when he was in that tour, when he was dropped from the test side um, didn't go to practice the next day. I mean, that, that sort of thing wouldn't be allowed now, but he said, oh, I'm not going to practice. And he went down somewhat in my estimation, but people like Sin Harris would give you everything the whole time, uh, in spite of the fact that they could be out on their feet almost, were very, very sick. Um, and there was a great spirit amongst that team. As I say, we were all fighting uh, the same enemy, as it were, really, in illness as well as the opposition. Mm, a battle that this group of players unequivocally lost, on the field anyway. But surely this was one of the most physically demanding tours ever to depart our shores. One only has to glance at the form and the absentees from the next fixtures New Zealand played to count the toll of 1955. But notwithstanding the trying conditions, the mysteries of the East tugged the players' curiosities. And those of you who have travelled through the subcontinent will know you feel like a witness to a kaleidoscope. That is, life lived on the edge. I know of no place where you can round a corner and have your senses assaulted so emphatically to see abject poverty coexisting with affluence to smell raw sewers and colourful spice shops and to hear the cries of a six-year-old beggar merging with the muezzin is unforgettable. I have to depart now, so don't you forget to spring to attention and lay preliminary plans to scan Sky's programming and absorb then the next mantis in the cricket. Tales from the Tours.